because if you have healthy plants, the pests are less um, because as soon as stress hits, they send off the signal and the bugs come. So like your pine trees, when they were drought stressed uh, this summer, they send out signals. The, the pine bark beetles catch that signal and they move in. Um, so if you keep them watered properly, that sap is flowing. The sap is what actually prevents those guys to get in. Um, so if you have healthy running sap, your, your trees aren't gonna get hit as often by the bores um, that, than they would if they're stressed out. Um, it goes for your perennials, your, your shrubs and trees as well. Um, aphids, they, they like those uh, situations where they can get under there and, and start feeding off of the leaves and things. So if you keep a healthy yard, um, you can prevent a lot of this stuff from happening. Um, the other thing you can do is pay attention to your garden. Go out there, look under your leaves, harvest from your garden, because if you have bugs, you're gonna see them while you're out there. It's really easy to see them. Um, and if you're, you're on it, um, you can control them faster than if you let it go for a week, you would be, uh, amazed by the population of white fly aphids that can populate in that week's time. So if you're on top of it, it's easier to prevent issues in the long run. Um, so planting them correctly um, for vegetable gardens and garden prep, you want to start in uh, February, um, getting your, your garden plot together, putting the manure, the, the mulch, get that organic material in there. Um, if you are planting regular trees, shrubs, perennials, uh, always use mulch as your organic matter. It helps break up that clay, uh, the soil. It gets gives it areas for your roots to start going. It also attracts your, your worms and all that healthy stuff that gets your soils moving and, and alive. Um, fertilization is a key here because we basically have a dead soil. Um, we have a lot of iron in our soil, but because of the high pH level that we have here, the trees just can't intake it. So we need that sulfur factor, which lowers our pH and helps things move into your trees and shrubs. So anybody that has like autumn blaze maples that have some yellowing leaves and the dark green veins in it, that's iron chlorosis. It's an iron deficiency. And so you need that um, soil acidifier, which has that iron in it. And you also need to put some sulfur down to help lower that pH. Or if you're using our 744 fertilizer, it does have that sulfur content in there. So if you use it that on a regular basis, you can keep your soils more neutral. Um, we are also going to talk about deers, rabbits, javelinas, um, trying to prevent uh, those things. Um, some of it is just common sense. Deers love soft vegetation. Um, any leafy tree that you have, they will look for the leaves. So you want to fence them when they're newly planted because it's like a new toy. They see it and say, ooh, look at this. Um, so Fence around it, even if it's a, a pine or a spruce, they get nosy and, and so they, they will nibble. Um, when deer and rabbits get hungry, they can eat anything, whether it's on our resistant list or not. Um, and some areas are more prone to different things. I have a rabbit that ate my cat mint down to the ground last year. Um, it, and it was because we were so severely dry and there was nothing to eat. So they were eating anything that was out there. Uh, my Sanalonia, uh, my lavender cotton, which is an evergreen ground cover, down to the ground, which it needed pruned anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> and it came back and it was beautiful. So um, know that even if it's on our resistant list, it's not foolproof. So pay attention. You can use some fencing uh, to keep those critters out. Um, 
electric fencing, it sounds complicated, but it really isn't. And if you set it on a timer, you know, it during the evenings, because that's when these critters are out, you can kind of eliminate some of that problems. Um, resistant plants. So I've got a collection here of our resistant plants. Like I said, again, it is on a list, the deer can't read lists, so they don't know. But when you plant, just kind of keep an eye on it. And, and if you need to protect it, do so. Chicken wire works good. I always call my place the chicken coop because I have so much chicken wire going around. Um, but if you want to stay just resistant, it's really easy to do uh, with paying attention to the plants that you plant. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of uh, these guys here. Uh, this is a honeysuckle, and this is the gold flame honeysuckle. Really beautiful flowers. Um, this is resistant, loves the full sun, um, and is resistant to the deer, rabbits. Javelina are usually the biggest culprits of not paying attention to the lists because they just go under looking for their rooting. Um, so if you see a lot of holes being dug in your property, it could be two things. Either the javelinas have come through or it's skunks. Skunks are looking for grubs, and, and so those grubs live under your soil. So if you start seeing little divots under your root plants uh, or your plant roots, you probably have skunks in your yard. Um, so, Huh? Uh, she just asked about gophers and gophers, usually if you have a gopher issue, you will know about it because you will have mounds um, and we will get into how to take care of them um, just a moment. Um, but um, honeysuckles are a great vine, very aggressive vines, so they can grow in that 15 foot or year range. Um, the gold flame is not an evergreen here, um, and it depends on the winter. If we have a very mild winter, it may stay green. Um, but if you're looking for a honeysuckle that is evergreen, it's the Hall's Japanese honeysuckle. Um, the flowers aren't as significant as the gold flame. Uh, they have little yellow and white flowers, smell amazing. Um, so if you are looking to have some privacy or um, on a fence, I always recommend mixing the two. That way you get the pretty flowers and then you get the evergreen of the halls. Uh, this is a Japanese barberry. Um, this guy is a lava nugget. Uh, lava nuggets, kind of one of the smaller varieties out there. Um, beautiful foliage, and they really go into color in the late summer and fall. Um, they do have thorns, which is one of the reasons that the, the critters don't like them. Um, like I said, you can't beat this foliage color. It gives you a pop of color in your, your with all your greens. It just makes it magnificent. So she just said her chipmunks strip hers on a daily basis. And it seems like the smaller critters are more troublesome than the bigger ones um, because a lot of times you can't get them to, to get, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Um, the, some of the hot peppered cayenne spray um, seems to work on, on the squirrels and the chipmunks. Um, the Mole Max, has garlic oil in it, so um, that clovey smell, um, sometimes those work as well. I just went to the cabinet and thought, what can I sacrifice? <laughs> and I put minced onions on it. And okay, the place smells a little bit like onions. Right. Perfect. Uh, so she uses minced onions. So if you have that, go to the dollar store, <laughs> chop up some onions, and throw them out there. Oh, there you go. Don't use the good stuff. <laughs> go to the dollar store and get the cheap stuff. Um, boxwood, 
uh, is one of my favorite plants because this guy is uh, extremely resistant to your deer, rabbits, javelina, all of that. Uh, really easy to take care of. Um, low maintenance, no diseases that I am aware of, no pests get into this. So if you want something that you can just plant and leave alone, this is probably it. Um, there are different sizes of the, the boxwood. Um, the winter gem gets in that five by five, nice hedge shrub, um, fills out really nicely. Um, this one's actually a petite pillar, which is a really cool dwarf boxwood. It kind of gets in that two by two. So if you need some evergreen in a perennial bed, this is a perfect size for that. Um, Green Mountain is if you need some height in a garden bed, um, it'll get about five to six foot and only three feet wide. So it kind of gives you that small tree-like feel in a small perennial bed. Hey, Michelle, we should pass the, uh, the oh, I always forget that. All right, so this is our um, pest and diseases newsletter list. So if you are not, uh, if you don't sign up, you will not receive the pamphlets and stuff for this. Um, so I'm going to start it over here. If Just put your name and email, and if you could write like a regular person and not a doctor, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, because Ken has to input it. Um, so um, that way you can get, uh, we're going to send out the... Uh, bug uh, information. Uh, it's a really great one with pictures so you can identify different pests and stuff. Uh, we're going to put the javelina and deer list on it as well, um, as along with our planting guide um, for basic general information. Uh, Dianthus is a great one um, for all garden beds. Um, this is an actual evergreen. Uh, this will stay this beautiful color all winter long. Um, smells like cloves when it's blooming. So it's a beautiful flower. Um, I did have some deer eat this uh, once, um, but it was a dry winter. Um, so if it is a dry winter, you might want to protect your stuff. Um, a little bit more than you would during a wet winter because if they can find the food, they won't come into your garden. Um, this is a, a, scent, a scent from heaven, um, but it's a really, really pretty pink flower uh, on it. And it goes for all the dianthus, they're all resistant. Oh, okay. Thanks for mentioning that, Ken. Um, so we kicked off our monsoon sale a week early this year. Um, so while you are shopping in the nursery, uh, take a look for the yellow stick or orange stickers and the green flagging tape. So the majority of stuff is on sale this year. Um, so take a look around. Um, it's a great time to uh, add fresh stuff to your beds. Um, maybe plan a new bed and get started that way. Uh, it's a great time to plant right now. Our humidity level is fabulous. The rain is helping um, things greatly. We haven't had to water too much. Um, so it's a great time to get stuff planted. Glardias, uh, they're one of my favorite flowers as well because they are basically um, one that blooms from like April till November. Once it frosts, they, they kind of go to seed and they're done. Um, but they bloom these really pretty flowers. As long as you keep them deadheaded, they'll bloom all summer long for you. Um, once we get towards the fall, um, let them go to seed. Um, that'll get you new plants in the springtime, and it also gives the birds something to eat uh, in the wintertime. Catmint uh, is another one that is very resistant, except if they're really hungry. Um, this is a wonderful one. It's actually a pink catmint. A lot of your catmints are going to be blue. Um, they come in a variety of sizes. There's dwarf ones that kind of stay in that 10-inch uh, size range. Uh, there are other ones that can get this tall. Um, so uh, look at your tags, kind of figure out what your space 
needs are. You know, do you need a small one? Do you need a tall one? Are you going to plant it in the back or are you going to plant it in the front? Um, so think about all these things before you start putting stuff in. I'm kind of an eclectic gardener and I have a hole I put stuff in and it's like, oops, things get really big and it's like, why did I put that there? But um, Catmint's a wonderful one. Uh, you just deadhead it about three times a year. And, and when I say deadhead, it's not fussy. Take a hedge clipper, just do that. Comes back up in two weeks, it's blooming again. How far down do you cut it off? I usually go to about six inches when I cut it um, down. Uh, you wanna leave a little bit just so you have something, but it usually comes up from the bottom anyway. Agastache is another resistant plant, and I love the agastache because uh, the hummingbirds, if you have bees, hummingbirds just love it. Um, they have these nice little tube uh, flowers. Uh, they come in a variety of colors. Right now, I just have the orange sunset, which is just absolutely fabulous. Um, these are the smaller ones, the kudos. Um, they kind of stay in that three-foot size range, so they don't get massive. Some of the old uh, agastache will get five or six foot, um, but the kudos kind of stay in that smaller size. Uh, this is the New Mexican Primrose. Uh, this is a fabulous ground cover. Um, you will get patches probably four or five foot um, big uh, or wide. Um, I planted some in June and I've already got a patch this big. Uh, so it's a great thing if you have space to fill. Um, if you want it to hang over a wall, it's a, another fabulous plant for something like that. And it blooms all summer long. My rabbits do like this, though. And there was a lady. I don't know if she's still here. Yes, she is. Um, she said she had one of these. Um, this is a lantana, and this is Miss Huff, which is a perennial lantana. Um, there are only two varieties of lantana that are perennial up here, uh, which is the Miss Huff, which gets in that four-foot size range, so it's a little bit bigger. And then Mary Ann is the low smaller one um, that stays in that two by two size range. Um, beautiful orange flowers on this one with a little pink included. Um, Mary Ann's more uh, pale with the pink and the yellow. Um, but it is on the resistant list. However, this lady right here uh, came to me earlier and she said, Hers that were just kind of hanging on the ground, her rabbits kind of trimmed it up for her, where she has another one that has rocks around it, they don't mess with. So sometimes it just, it, it pays to get a little bit creative. And if you make it a little bit more difficult for things, they leave it alone. So does that, is normally that uh, have more pink in it? Uh, it's usually more this beautiful orange. Okay, it, it's so the darker. Pink the pink and yellow one's Marianne, and she stays smaller. She stays smaller. And, oh. and things will fade, um, you know, depending on the, si uh, the sun. Um, in our sun, we tend to fade out um, a little bit. Um, and then the rain. Um, the rain will pale stuff out, too. Coreopsis is a great resistant. I've never had anything eat this, which is really weird because you'd think something like this would be just be breakfast buffet. Um, it does have a little bit a tougher leaf, which maybe is part of the reason. Um, but this is another one that blooms all summer long. Um, this one's one of the smaller ones, kind of gets in that foot size range, full sun. Um, basically everything I've shown you so far is a full sun plant. Um, so a lot of options available for you guys. Coneflower is another one on the list. And I will tell you, my rabbits love this guy. I have very finicky or gourmet rabbits, I guess. They, they like this coneflower. They've eaten my purple one. Um, so I, I try to protect, I, I just, 
I also have pack rats, which are another issue altogether. And, and for pack rats, the, the snap traps are the only thing that works for those. Um, pack rats aren't picky. Uh, they don't pay attention to any of our lists, so they will eat everything. Um, Centranthus is one of my worst enemies for that. I, I keep buying it and they take it down within weeks. Um, which is weird. I don't know. Um, but coneflower is another one. It has this really sticky, uh, fuzzy leaf. Um, so they're not supposed to like it. Like I said, they tend to do that for me. Yeah. They, they, grasshoppers. grasshoppers will eat anything and everything in sight. Um, so the trick with grasshoppers is to catch them early when in the season uh, with the nolo bait, which we... Usually they start May, Mayish. Yeah, um, I had some early May, and they're when you, if you can get the nolo bait down when they're little, um, you can pretty much get rid of that colony um, ahead of time. Um, if not, the Sayonara, uh, which is our bug spray, and I'll go into a little bit more depth with that later. Um, it, you can spray over the top of them, spray your plants, and, and anything that it touches, will it'll kill them. Uh, so grasshoppers, they're, they're not picky either. This one is one that usually is... is really safe. Um, this is a society garlic. Um, it comes in a lot of different colors of variegated leaf, uh, which is really, really pretty. Um, it smells like onions. Uh, so it, it, things leave it alone. Even the javelinas tend to leave this guy alone. Um, but they bloom all through the year. Uh, so it's a great, uh, great one to add. Um, the long stalks give you some height in a garden. So it's a great plant to have. So uh, autumn sage, which is a member of the salvia family, which is a huge family. Um, and there are all different types of salvias. Um, this is autumn sage. It's uh, more of shrubby. It's woody. Um, anything that has that sagey scent is usually safe from, from the deer, rabbits, and javelina. Um, where did it go? This is also a salvia a sage. Um, so... Where did it go? This is also a salvia sage. So hundreds of different varieties of these, and they're all resistant to animals. <laughs> Unfortunately, because of this rule, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's what the hedge clippers are for. These come in a variety of colors as well. Um, this one's uh, kind of a magenta red. Uh, radio red is probably the purest red that's out there. Uh, ignition purple is a gorgeous purple color. Uh, blue note actually has a true blue flower on it. Um, so you can get them in all different colors to match your color scheme. Nandina uh, is another one, um, and this is just a greenery plant. Um, but the great thing about this is that it's compact size. Uh, this guy gets in that three to four foot size range, and it has wonderful fall foliage, um, and it'll keep you um, in that Christmas mood all winter long. Um, because as the fall uh, gets closer, um, it'll start turning red and it'll stay that color until you trim it up a little bit in the springtime and then it'll go back to green. Do they get berries here? They do. Um, so the berries I've been told are very poisonous. Um, so if you have that issue, cut off the flowers when it's blooming and, and you won't have that problem. Um, it, it, it's just as simple as that. Yeah. Typically leave it alone because um, it is a woody shrub. Um, and, and it does come in a diff of several different sizes. There is the traditional uh, Nandina, which is usually taller than I am, more tree-like. Um, the dwarf, Harbor Dwarf Nandina is one of those one and a half to two foot size. So 
you can find the right size for your garden that you need. This one works really well in a pot, it looks really pretty. Everybody's favorite, especially yours, you want one? <laughs> um, Russian sage. Um, it's a great plant for, for those back areas of your yard. Um, the bees love this. So if you're planting it for one reason um, only, just to bring in bees to your property, it's a great one for that. Um, you can't beat this color, uh, even if it's annoying and a pain in the butt. You can't beat this color and you can see it from miles away. Um, so it's a great thing to have. Um, these also come in different sizes and the crazy crazy blue and lacy blue ones kind of are those dwarf sizes and only get about three foot. And they're not as prolific as this one. So a little bit easier to control. Junipers are another one that are on the list, um, and junipers come in all shapes and sizes as well. Uh, this is a dwarf uh, garden juniper. Uh, we also have um, the um, buffalo juniper, the mint julep juniper, which gets five feet tall. Um, we also, uh, tamarack is a ground cover juniper that kind of gets three feet and then it'll spread out to six to eight feet. So um, junipers are a great plant and we can find one that will fit your area. <sighs> Cotone asters. Uh, Cotone asters are also another great ground cover, um, animal resistant. Um, spread six to eight feet tall. And depending on the size of Cotone Aster you get um, can vary on the size. Uh, so it starts at the six inch, which is the, the Strebe's uh, Cotone Aster. Uh, the Eckholtz kind of gets in that foot size range. The Coral Beauty gets in that three foot size range. There's a um, gray leaf Cotone Aster that kind of gets in that four to five. It's not a ground cover, so it doesn't spread out so much. Um, the Parnii Cotone Aster doesn't even look like a Cotone Aster. It, it kind of has that lacy uh, wind, uh, branching. Um, they all get those little white flowers in the springtime and beautiful red berries in the fall. Um, and the birds love them. So another plant that we can find a plant that'll fit your, your garden. No, Cotone asters do not have thorns. You're thinking of the pyracantha. Uh, pyracantha is another uh, deer resistant. I don't know why I didn't grab it because we have a lot of them, um, but it is a resistant uh, plant as well. Um, also has the pretty red, orange and red berries um, and the birds love it. So when you're planting your gardens, think about your birds in the fall and winter because they, they do suffer a little bit, butterflies. Um, in the, the winter time, they love to hide in the, the evergreens and, and having that food source is also a good thing. Marigolds are one of those that my rabbits like this guy. They, they eat this down, so I don't plant them no more. Um, um, but they, they, they um, repel pests from your vegetable gardens and such. Um, so it, it's a good one to plant as a companion plant in your garden. Um, so keep that in mind when you do that. And it's also very, very pretty. It's a, it's a great fall plant. This is a blue salvia. Um, this is the Sally Fun Deep Blue. Um, hummingbirds love this plant and um, great in pots. Uh, looks great with lantana. Um, the colors, the orange and the, the purple are just amazing. Um, but any type of salvia, like I said before, it, it, you're, you're really safe with. 
So that's the thing with the salvias, and that's a great question. She asked if it comes back every year. Um, this is actually an annual salvia, so it will not come back. It is an annual plant, uh, so you will have to replant it in the springtime. It's like a petunia. You know, think of it as a petunia, and you just get some height and some beautiful color. Uh, herbs are another... Um, are, are wonderful plants that, that the animals tend to leave alone. Um, your thyme, mint, oregano, and sage are actually evergreen here. Um, so they will stay uh, out in the cold all winter long. Um, so you can put them next to your house and have a winter herb garden uh, as well. Um, basil is one of the herbs that Havelina just love. Uh, one of our co-workers, Doug, his wife makes pesto, and every year they come in and dig up his pesto. And it's like, ah! And he's always buying more, more basil so he can make more pesto. Uh, lavender and rosemary are the other ones uh, in that herb group. Um, and these guys make wonderful landscape plants. Um, this one is a platinum blonde lavender. It is an English uh, variety of lavender. Uh, it has variegation, which is really, really cool. And it adds a pop of color or different texture to your garden. Uh, rosemary, whether it's the, the Huntington carpet, creeping rosemary, um, or the Tuscan blue, which is an upright rosemary. All, all these are herbs and, and the deer and animal resistant. And they're all going into bloom. Uh, the rosemaries are starting to bloom right now. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I honestly, I don't know how they propagate that. Um, so I, I, if, just stick it in water, is that what you do? Really? Okay. So we just heard that you can stick it in water and propagate it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, bugs kind of don't, they, they don't care. Okay. Um, so the cyanara is what you want to spray it with. And unfortunately, Rosa Sharon are really, it's one of those magnet plants that they tend to do in the winter, uh, fall. Yeah. It's kind of like roses in the springtime, Rosa Sharon in the summer. Um, okay. Um, I did bring in some shady uh, plants as well that are resistant. Um, Hookera, corabels. Um, this is a fabulous plant, and, and I, I'm very surprised that it's actually resistant. Um, but there is a texture to the leaves, which makes it not appealing to, to the animals. Um, the fabulous thing about the hookera, it, it can it comes in a variety of different colors. Um, the reds, the purples, the orange, uh, lime green, um, which is a hard one to find, um, but great shade plant. Um, can tolerate a little bit of morning sun, but it doesn't like that hot afternoon sun. Um, they kind of like it a little bit more moist, but usually in your shady spots anyway, you're going to have a little bit more uh, moisture conditions. Um, most of your perennials during the heat of the summer, you want to water probably twice a week. Uh, your shrubs and your trees once a week should be fine for them uh, unless they're newly planted. And then you can do twice a week uh, during that heat uh, time frame, May and June, where we have the winds and the heat and all of that. Um, this is um, a juga, uh, bugleweed, um, and I just brought both varieties because I think they're spectacular as far as the, the color goes. Um, this one has a variegated leaf and a more lighter purple color on the flower at stock. This is black scallop, and so the leaves really get really dark and, and beautiful, and then it has a dark blue flower on it. Um, 
both also love the shade. A little bit of morning sun's okay, but that hot afternoon shade they need to be out of. Compact grape, Holly. Um, this one is one that's more versatile uh, in this area, so it can handle that shady spot, um, and it also can handle some sun. Uh, the compact, it's in that four-foot size range. Um, there are also the creeping Mahonias uh, that stay low to the ground. Uh, beautiful yellow flowers on this guy in the uh, springtime. And then they have the little blueberries in the fall and winter. Uh, Oregon grape poly or Mahonia. And this is a, a, a Japanese U. Um, this is a spreading one. So he's going to get in that six foot wide range uh, and about four foot tall. Um, loves the shade. Uh, great hedge plant if you needed something uh, to go around a shady spot. Um, there's also the Hicks U, which is more upright and gives you that height uh, in certain areas. Uh, they can get 12 feet tall. Um, if you let them go, um, and uh, only about three feet wide. Uh, your trees, I did bring some trees up here. Um, the ash trees are really resistant um, to, you want me to bring that over? No. Okay. Um, so the ash trees um, are, are resistant, um, but any new plant they're going to test. Uh, so if you're in a deer zone, I would fence it just to be on the safe side, especially coming up in the fall. That's when they, they're, they're doing their things with their horns and, and rubbing up and down. Um, there are wraps that you can put around. If you put some chicken wire around that your, your trunk of your tree, that'll help as well um, to keep them from t tearing off that cambium layer. Because once they take off more than half of that, your tree's dead. Um, your pines, this is an Oregon uh, green pine. Um, going to get in that 25 foot size range and about 15 wide. Uh, great size for this tree. I just love the formation of this one. Um, he, he's so unique looking. I just love this pine. Um, blue spruces are another one. And I had to pick up the heaviest bucket. <laughs> This is Colorado blue spruce. Um, and this will get 40 feet tall, about 25 wide, um, and, and resistant to the deer, rabbits, javelina. Um, again, if they're desperate enough, they're going to munch um, just because it's their nature. Um, but it's a good plant to have if you're adding trees to your, your garden area. Um, and it, it's usually resistant. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about prevention of uh, the critters. Um, so we've talked about fencing for your deer. Um, deer can hop over a six foot fence um, very, very easily. Um, so think taller or electrify it because they will touch a six foot fence and if they get zapped a couple of times, they will leave it alone. Um, Fencing around new trees is also a, a fabulous idea. Um, where are you going? Eh. There are repellents out there uh, for it. Um, Spray-ons, there's granules that you can put down. Um, they all have different ingredients, uh, like this, this has egg solids and garlic in it, um, cloves, anything spicy. Um, when you, This is a repellent. It doesn't keep them away. It just kind of shoes them away. Um, with our intense sunshine and the rain that we've been having, you do need to reapply it more than the container says. So if you're going to use it that way, please reapply or you won't be safe. Um, for the smaller critters, uh, Momax is a great um, 
preventer. Uh, preventer. Um, it, it, so basically you spread this on the ground and you start from your house and you work out because anything that's living close, you want to get rid of and push them out that way. So it does take some time to get that moving. So you start with barriers. Um, or if you have a vegetable garden that they're kind of coming in, you can do a four foot swatch around it. Um, I've used it for gophers and it does keep them away from your area, but I tend to see them moving in one direction or the other. Um, so do reapply it um, as needed. And if you start seeing uh, the mounds and the holes for the gophers, do so. Um, and it does need to be watered in. So now it's a good time to get it on there because it goes down into the holes. No. My rat issues, I don't know if they're high maintenance, powerful rats, but the rat trap with a little bit of uh, peanut butter in it works like a charm. And I'm not squeamish about it. Um, while I have this here, um, right now, um, most of our trees are fruiting. Um, I had a gal that went on vacation and her cherries were just getting about, they just started turning green and then she went on vacation. They're all gone. I don't know what happened. I said, well, did you have a net on it? And she says, well, no. And it's like they started ripening and the birds picked them all off. So uh, putting a, a net over your trees once your fruit starts going uh, will save your fruit from the birds. Um, so, huh? <laughs> yeah, birds, and when you put this over, basically you're going to cover the whole tree and then secure it, because if you don't secure it, they can get up underneath there. Um, even though you think you're being tricky, they, they can get in there. Um, and they come in variety of sizes, so if you have a big tree, you can uh, put them on that too. Um, she said she used the silver tape, and it's like, well, that works for a little bit, but it, once they get used to it, it, it doesn't work anymore. Um, gophers. Um, so we did talk a little bit about the, the, the Molmax. Um, so Molmax is a preventative and, and it, you kind of push them away. Um, gopher shields is another one that work really well. Um, you actually put your plant in this and then you plant it in your hole. Um, so it keeps, it gives you enough space for the roots to kind of start going out and then it, it kind of protects that main chunk of your root system. Um, but if you have gophers, the best thing to do is get rid of them because they multiply three, three times a year. Um, so if you just let them go, you, you are going to be battling. And it, it's a non-ending battle. Um, just because you kill a few, they, they will come back. Um, this is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. Um, so this is a grofer probe. And so I started with the Molmax, and that got to be a pain in the butt. So I said, well, I'm just going to get rid of them. So I started with this. So the, basically how you use this um, go through your property, all your mounds, step on, kick over, make them level with the ground because you're looking for that new dirt mound um, because that's where they're fresh digging. Um, once you start seeing that, then you can start probing and you'll do this a couple of times and all of a sudden you're on the ground uh, because you'll find that tunnel and that's where you need to be. Where? Chair. I already got it out. Okay, so this is the bait that goes in it, and it's a one-kill bait, which is a great thing because if something eats that gopher, it won't hurt whatever eats them. Um, so your bait goes into this, and then this releases it out of this little hole into the tunnel itself. Um, so the likelihood of something getting it, unless you have something that digs, uh, is, is very little. Um, but like I said, I just, every week I go out, um, I look for new mounds. Once I do my probing, I kick it over. So I know I've taken care of that area and I look for new mounds. Um, it's working. Um, but it's one of those things. If I don't 
pay attention to it next month. I have new holes and I have to start all over again. So it, gardening is not an easy task and you're in, in it for life. So you, these are just chores that you have to put on your to-do list. Uh, and if you like to garden, this is what we do. Okay, let's talk about bugs a little bit. So uh, bugs are, right now we're seeing blister beetles, we're seeing squash beetles, um, hornworms, um, what else have I seen? Um, Coddling moth, which we're a little late for uh, all of those apples that have the little holes in them. We should have taken care of that in the spring, like we told you to. Um, but um, bugs, Sayonara is our new bug spray. Um, works great. Um, it is a crushed chrysanthemum derivative, so it, it's non-toxic. You can use it on your vegetable gardens, aphids all that type of stuff. Um, grasshoppers, this works great on. Um, the the nolo bait that didn't work, um, that got wet, this is working on them now. So um, when you put this in a sprayer, you can use a regular spray nozzle, or if you have a large area, um, the Hudson sprayer is a hose end sprayer, which is a fabulous product. It's kind of pricey, um, but if you take care of this, you'll never have to buy another sprayer again. Um, because, and the great thing about this is you put your product in here, um, it mixes up in this gold part. When you're done, if you have product in here, you pour it right back into the bottle. It doesn't mix it. So you don't have to waste that extra product. Um, the most important thing about this is make sure it's cleaned out. If you do not rinse this out, you will be coming back saying, my sprayer doesn't work. Um, but it needs to be cleaned out really well with soap and water before you use it again. Um, and you should have two on hand, um, especially if you're gonna use a weed killer um, you never want to use a weed killer and your insect spray in the same bottle um, because if there's any residue in, of the weed spray in your insect killer, you're spraying this on your pretty flowers and they are going to die. So always have one that's really marked uh, for weeds and for your insect and um, for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically, it's like when you bring vegetables home from the supermarket, you always wash them off. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Um, so just wash it off. It's, it's safe for all that edible stuff. So yeah, absolutely. So Michelle, we have a bunch of friends coming over tonight for party after hours. Mm -hmm. And we're in the garden, of course. I was spraying cyanara this, this morning to keep rid of the flies and mosquitoes. Because, you know, you can't have that. One fly will make the party so good. One mosquito, one gal gets bit by a mosquito, everyone's indoors. So I just sprayed them this morning, the, the shrubs where they kind of hang out. Really, and you won't see no bugs. You need to start that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then one last thing with the bug spray, and you can actually use this for your weed killers. Um, your uh, weed killers and your bug killers. This is a sticker spreader. And basically it, it, it's just a sticky substance that makes it hold better. Um, so it just gives it a little extra dose of staying power on whatever you're, you're spraying. Um, so always get this with that and it works really well. Um, other things that we're having issues with um, are weeds. Um, obviously with the monsoons, um, if you didn't get your preventer, uh, pre-emergent down, we have weeds. Mine are taller than me, uh, in the spots that I didn't put the preventer in. Um, so the weed whacker is going all the time. <laughs> um, but, um, decimate is, uh, a, a weed killer that 
is non-selective, which means it'll kill everything and out uh, everything. Um, so spray it on, um, let it work uh, three to five days and then everything is gonna die. Don't cut it right after you spray it, just let the sun do its work and, and, it, and it works really well. Um, also kind of wait, uh, so we have about 24 hours before it rains again, and that way you get a little extra working power because uh, it, it's dr safe, dry, dry safe, within two hours, uh, but it'll work better if it really gets sunshine for a couple days. Yeah. And you need that sunshine for it to actually work. It needs that heat to, to percolate. Um, this is our selective weed killer, which is, so you can use this in the grass. Um, it doesn't kill your grasses. It, it works on broadleaf weeds. Um, so this is just a spot treatment spray. Michelle, I can say I had a rental where the weeds in the back inside the garage would just go crazy. I took the hose and sprayer and the decimate and set it on 10 tablespoons per gallon. And I, I killed off like a huge swath of weeds like that with no energy. Perfect. So it worked out really, really well. Yeah. And so the hose and sprayer just makes it easier for you. Um, pump up sprayers. It's kind of a pain in the butt to redo, and then you, you do, and you have to run back and forth. But the pump ups or the hose in sprayer, you don't have to do that. You just fill it up and go, and you can usually do a really large area with it. Um, the other thing that we're seeing right now is a lot of fun fungal issues um, because of our moisture that we're having. Um, we've actually had fungal issues since mid-June because of our humidity level. Um, so revitalizes our fungicide and the concentrate, you can actually treat it as a soil drench and as a foliar spray. Um, so for powdery mildews, black spot, you, any of your vegetable spots or blight, uh, issues that you have in your vegetable garden, this works really well on. Um, also for your fruit trees, if you are having black stems on your trees, especially apples and pears, um, you probably have fire blight and it's been pretty bad this year. Um, so two things about fire blight is it's really, really important before you start doing anything, have a mixture of bleach and water in your while you're out there. Every time you cut, you're gonna dip your pruners in there because fire blight is very uh, contagious. Um, so with your fire blight, you have a black stem that comes down to here. You've got greenery on your trunk down to here. You wanna go at least eight inches um, down into good wood and cut. Then you dip your pruners and then you go to the next branch. A lot of times you can actually cut fire blight out, um, but I always spray on top of it just to make sure that we're, we're keeping the immune system on your trees and tr uh, your apple trees and pears down. I, I do 10 to 1. Um, and it, it's just to sanitize your pruners. That'll work too. Um, basically, you're just getting all that bacteria off your pruners. So whatever you want to use, that's fine. But it's really, really important to clean your pruners. Because if you don't and you take it to a new leaf, or another branch, you're going to just spread it to that point. Okay. Um, general maintenance. Now, if you haven't fertilized in July, now is a good time to do it. Um, we want to fertilize three times a year, and we usually do it on the holidays, uh, Easter, 4th of July, and Halloween. Um, evergreens do get a New Year's dose as well. Um, so we want to keep our uh, trees healthy, our shrubs and perennials, even though they're dormant. Um, if you feed in the fall, that just gives them extra staying power. It, it recycles the roots and, and gives you a good boost in the spring. Um, I think I'm done. Questions? So uh, she has a question of, about thrip. And basically for all your bugs and diseases, it's always good practice to um, 
spray the dormant oil in February and March before your trees and shrubs leaf out because what the dormant oil does is it coats your branches and you wanna spray underneath on top of, you just really wanna coat it. And basically it smothers everything that's just laying dormant on those tissues. Um, so that will help. Um, also thrip um, kind of fly in with the, the March breezes. So even though we do do the dormant oil, sometimes we'll get an another batch that comes in afterwards uh, and the Sayonara, it, it, I just start spraying my roses starting in March just because I know that's going to happen. My peonies, I start as soon as I start seeing a little bit of a bud, I, I, I put on the, the, the resistant, uh, the cyanara because it leaves a residue. And if they start eating that, they, they die and, and they go away. Okay. Anything else? Well, I thank you all for coming. I appreciate all your time and um, sorry for the... Great. Worked out great. All right. So thank you. Yeah, there's nothing.